First of all, just to get this out of the way, um, I'm on day eight of a, uh, of a cold, and I, f- I, I feel better than I sound. Now, don't come with these comments and say, well, you sound better than you look, all right? So we don't want to go there. But um, So um, I wouldn't be here if I, if I were contagious, so uh, I feel good. My goal in this message today is twofold. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number one is to preach God's Word, and hopefully you can get some help and some strength out of the message. The second goal is not to drown on my own phlegm, okay? So, so bear with me as I work through that. Um, it's crazy. It's like I've got a waterfall going on, um, and uh, I'm just, you know, whatever. So it's one of those times. Y'all, it's so good to get our youth back. Uh, we, uh, you know, one of the jokes around here is our bus that we bought a few years ago. Uh, you know, it, 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 we give it a hard time, but it, it, well, it's a workhorse. It, it does the job, right? And we always spend money on it, get it ready to go to camp, and then something happens. And so they had a blowout on the way going, but eh, no problem, no big deal. And that was the only hiccup they had with the bus. But they had a great camp. They came back yesterday, and uh, a lot of times when these kids get off the bus, you can tell if it was a good camp or not, and usually when they're, I mean, they're all wanting to go home, they're all wanting to get in their own bed, get in their own space and all that, but I've seen them get off the bus, and man, I mean, before you could say hello, they were in the car burning rubber and getting out, and you could tell, "Ah, I don't think they enjoy camp this year, but uh, (laughs) this year, uh, obviously, they had a great time, and uh, they were hanging around for a little bit, but they were all ready to go home. And Brother Cameron, good to have you uh, as our youth pastor. Appreciate the awesome work you all are doing and uh, the great camp that you had. So thank you all, church. You know, it's amazing when we get to this point in the year, we're July 31st. Uh, I mean, life is getting ready to really get kicking here again, and I like it. I like it. We're done with our Wednesday night sabbaticals, so we're back in gear this week, back on for Wednesday night. How many of, all exci- uh, how many of you all are excited about that? Yeah? Good. <clears throat> I'm excited about it, and tomorrow night we have our legacy men, and we'll tell you more about that. But, and you know what this means, too? When school starts back, guess what else? Football season. And guess what else? Happens right after football season starts. Hunting season. It's my time of the year. Aren't you happy for me? <clears throat> Anyhow, if I don't drown before I get there. So, um, either next week or the week after. Depends how I'm feeling physically. Um, I want to start it next week, but it looks like we're going to start our new, new series either next week or the week after on the book of Acts. But before we do that, I want to talk to you today about a subject matter that we've talked about in the past in various ways. It's titled The Secret to Contentment. The Secret to Contentment. Now listen, I'm not one of those guys that that likes to come up with some catchy title and use the word secret, like I've got the magic formula. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about it in that way. And I want you to see what Paul talks about, how he found in his life a way to be content. Now, what does it mean to be content? (coughs) Excuse me. It literally means self-sufficient in a good. Self-sufficient in a good, as though you would have something to offer. Some kind of good, you know, like goods, some kind of thing, and you're, you're self-sufficient in it. You, you feel pretty good about what you've created or what you're getting ready to offer. It means to hold in, to contain. It literally means this, not needy. Think about that for a moment. Not needy. When you are content... In Christ, you're not needy. 
You're not wanting others to fulfill things in you that only God can fulfill. And so that's what the word contentment means. It means literally to be good in the midst of circumstances, whatever they might be. So take your Bibles, go to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. Would you stand with me as we read God's Word? Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. So Paul is talking to the Philippian believers, and he is encouraging them, and he is explaining to them that they met the need that he had in his ministry. He says, indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this, or I can do all things through Christ, through Him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is to be, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment, and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet or will supply all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. To God and Father, to our God and Father, Be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful letter. This intimate and yet uh, peek behind the curtain, if you will, of Paul's life to his Philippian brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for his vulnerability. And thank you for Him revealing to us what true contentment can look like. Help us as your people to be contented with Jesus. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I know I've used this illustration before, but it seems to happen every time I go to the gas station. You get to the gas station, and I love living in a small town because often you'll meet somebody that you know, or you'll see somebody that you should know, you don't know their name, but you, 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 you know, you've seen each other trying to figure out where. You know, you go to the grocery store, you see people you know almost all the time. I know some of you are like, man, I just want to go to the grocery store, get my stuff, and go home. I don't want to talk to anybody. But you live in a small town, that's not happening, all right? So... But I notice when you go to the gas station, and because I feel it in me, I'm pretty happy when I get there, and by the time I get about halfway through pumping, I'm really not happy anymore. And then by the time I look at it and I went, man, a year and a half ago, I paid half this much. This is a tax on poor people. Everybody's mad. I'm looking. People are slamming their door, getting in their car. They're burning out when they are leaving. And I'm like, the whole country is mad every time they go to a gas station. I'm telling you, man, you got to watch it now. People are just, they're aggravated. Have you watched the news lately? Hmm? 
I mean, think about it right now. The big cities all over America, not just big cities, but cities like the size of Gainesville and stuff, man. I tell you, there are places now that, ooh, it's, it's dangerous. Be careful where you go. Watch out where you are. I mean, people are getting carjacked at gas stations and all of that. And you're like, preacher, why are you scaring us that way? No, I'm just telling you what's going on in the world. It's happening, right? So if you look at all this stuff all around us, you look at the politics, you look at the moral decay, the cultural rot, you look at everything that's going on, do you, do, do you ever think and wonder, what is there to really live for? What is there to be happy about? I mean, the world is changing. It's not like it was when I was growing up in, in the good ways. And, and we're losing our, our moral moorings, if you will. And if you don't watch it, you'll get on social media. You'll look at all of this stuff. And you know what you're going through. And then you look at everybody else on Facebook, and it's like they're having the time of their lives. Because that's all they ever post is the good stuff, right? And you wonder, can I ever be happy? I mean, you start worrying. If you're a man my age, I, I'm concerned about the world that my grandchildren are growing up in. If you're younger, you worry about the world that your children will be growing up in. There's a lot to be concerned about and a lot to be concerned about. But as Christians, we've got to keep this in mind. We're not the only generations, generation of Christians that have had these things to deal with. I mean, it used to be a lot worse. I mean, you, have, you had the, the penalty of death on most Christians throughout history. As they walked out of their house to go do commerce and to go live their lives. And there are some Christians today in, 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 in some countries throughout the world right now that are being hunted down and stalked for murder to be killed. So we're not the only ones. So the question is, how can we live in a anti-God world, in a world full of drama, in a world full of selfishness, in a world full of difficulty, and yet find peace and contentment? Well, the Bible has the answer for us. I want to give you three things about contentment. Here's the first thing. Number one, Christians who are content are not the victims of circumstances. You hear what I'm saying? Christians who are content are not the victims of circumstances. In other words, people and Christians who have learned what biblical contentment can be in their heart, they've learned how to move past victimization. Look, today... In the culture we live in, they want you and me to be victims. And they want us to have an axe to grind against some group or somebody all the time. That somebody has done us wrong, and so therefore somebody else has to pay. And yet, it could be someone's ancestors that did something, and it's constant victimization on and on and on. And Christians are not to live that way. You see, we are not subject to our circumstances. Our circumstances don't dictate how we respond all the time. Because if that were the case, we as Christians would be like a ship without a rudder. We would be on the high seas, tossed to and fro with every wind that comes by, with every tide change, with every storm. And we would just be a victim of circumstance. And in order to find contentment, 
to find that place in your life where you're good in your circumstances. You find yourself self-sufficient in Christ. In other words, Christ is enough for me. You realize that circumstances don't dictate our spiritual temperature. Now, God can use our circumstances to develop us, to grow us. But our circumstances do not dictate who we are. Correct? And Paul says that. Now, look at several things here that I want you to see under this heading here. First of all, in verse 11, he says this, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So, number one, I can accept. I can accept all things. As a Christian, nothing that happens to me should destroy me because God knows what's going on in my life. And I can accept all things in spite of all of that. Look, it's not what happens to me, but it's what I allow to happen within me. Follow me? Excuse me, I'm sorry for coughing into the mic here. I can accept all things. The second thing I want you to see here is that Paul reminds us that, he goes, you know, in Christ I have all things. I have all things. In verse 18 he says, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. I have what I need. And on a spiritual level, we find contentment when we realize that Jesus is enough. I have what I need in Jesus. All that I am is found in Jesus. I'm in him and he is in me. And I have it in him. There's not another person on the face of the earth that can meet my needs like Jesus. I got everything met for me that I need in this life in the person of Jesus Christ. I have all things. Look, I'm a happily married man. And and listen, I, I... I'm not saying I'm more than anybody else, but I'm saying I'm as equal to anybody else when it comes to this. But I'm at the high end of leaning on my spouse. I'm at the high end of needing my spouse. I'm at the high end of of wanting my spouse. I'm at the high end of, of, of my spouse being my best friend. And if there's a person in all of this world that helps me more than anybody else, It's her, but it's still not her job to meet my every need. Only Jesus can do that. And so in Jesus, I have all things. Because, you know, some nights when I'm really tired, and my spouse is really tired, she keeps me up by snoring. You said that about your wife? Well, yeah. And by the time I finally fall asleep, after kicking her 28 times, I start snoring. And at 4 in the morning, she's wide awake because I'm snoring. And I know what she's thinking. You know, we never thought about this, but we're just going to have to sleep in two different rooms. She brings that up to me every now and then, and I'm like, no way. And she realizes in me that she'll never have all of her needs met. I'm just a man. And I have a role in her life. And she has a role in my life. And God has used marriage for His glory. But, There's no human on the face of the earth that can meet your need like Jesus. So I can accept all things, Paul says. I have all things. And Paul even goes further than that. He goes, I have more than enough. And then notice this third thing here about the circumstances. I can do all things. Verse 13. It's the verse that Tim Tebow invented. (laughs) I literally had somebody tell me that one time. 
Somebody said, yeah, isn't that verse, like, uh, isn't that in the Bible that, that, uh, that Philippians 4.13, isn't that the verse that Tim Tebow came up with? Uh, no, he didn't come up with it. He, 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 like everybody else, he just put it on his, his eye black here. It was long before Tim was born, it was there. <clears throat> but aren't you grateful that somebody made it popular? I am. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, <clears throat> so that's where contentment comes in, man. That's where it really lands in my life. That whenever things go sideways, whenever things get out of my control, have you ever been in a circumstance or situation, you could see it coming from a mile, you could see the situation going bad, and you nor anyone else that was with you had the power or the capabilities of changing what was coming and what was happening. And what that tells me is that God is allowing that to happen so that he can prove to you and use you to demonstrate that you can do all things that he commissions you to do in Jesus Christ. You can do it. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've looked at situations in life and said, I can't do this. Uh, how many of y'all uh, are terrible when it comes to math? I'm talking about higher end math. I'm not talking about adding and subtracting, but like trigonometry, um, calculus, heck, throw in physics. I'm gone. I can't do it. But you know what? If I had to, I would. And God would give me what I needed when I needed it to do what I needed to do. A case in point in my case is that you know this about me and my life? I was, um, I don't like to be in front of people. I'm, I'm, I'm the shy kid. I don't like to talk. I know some of you are going, and now he went to lying. <laughs> He's lying. Don't believe him. I just like to be by myself sometimes. And when God called me into the ministry, man, I, I wasn't like the... the the guy who God called in ministry who ran and ran and ran from it. I accepted it. I, I ran toward it. But I, I ran toward it and I went, uh oh. <laughs> that means I gotta preach. <laughs> means I gotta do this. That means I gotta do that. And I was reminded through the scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can. So contentment. Christians who are content are not the victims of circumstance. Second thing, contentment is a learned experience. It's what we call the inner peace. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. About that? I know what it is to be in need, he says, and I know what it is to have plenty. And then he says this, I have learned, there it is, the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I have learned, he says, the secret. He goes, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've experienced it, and I've learned through my experience and through the truth how to be content. The only way you and I can grow in contentment, in our, when I say self-sufficiency, I'm not talking about outside of Christ. I'm talking about self-sufficient in Christ. 
in order to get to that place, I have to be willing to grow. I have to be willing to learn. And I've got to allow God to use the circumstances of life not to control me, but to teach me. And then through my experience, I'm learning all the time. I'm learning each and every time. And in learning that, I've come to a place that, you know what? I can get all huffy and puffy about things that I can't control, and I still won't be able to change them. And then that situation comes and goes, and life just continues to go on. And through experience and through realizing that all that stress that I was in and all that stress that I created for myself over that circumstance that I couldn't control was needlessly spent. And now that I'm growing as a Christian, I've come to a place where I have inner peace. I trust God that he's going to work it out. I trust God that he's going to use it for the furtherance of the gospel. I trust God that he's going to use it to grow me and teach me. I trust God that he will use it in my life to maybe help someone else grow and be taught. And in that, I can be at a place of contentment. It's a learned experience. I was talking to one of my kids the other day, and uh, we're talking about changing in life, and as you grow, people should be able to see, people that are close to you, people that know you, they ought to be able to see a change in you. And my youngest daughter, Marcy, she said, Dad, I know when you change. And I went, oh, really? When? I just want, I wanted to know what, what she thought change looked like. She goes, you remember that deer you shot? Right behind the house, that nine-pointer? Yeah. Remember I, I helped you put it on the golf cart or, or, or on the, no, on the, uh, on the four-wheeler and you drug, you, you drug it around? Yeah. And you remember you, you cranked it up on your skinning rack? Uh-huh. You skinned that whole thing and you started to crank it again to start quartering it up and the rope popped. And the whole carcass of the deer fell on the ground, on the dirt. Yeah? And I'm thinking, what did I do? And she goes, I'll never forget. I looked at you and I thought, oh boy, he's going to be mad. And she she said, Dad, you looked and you went, oh, I need to go get another rope. And you went, you got another rope. You put it on there. You cranked the deer back up. You washed it off. You were happy all the way, and you did it. And I went, really? A deer falling off of, you know, breaking off of the skinning rack and falling on the ground is a moment in time you think I changed? And you saw it? She goes, yeah. In the past, man, you might have taken the deer and thrown it in the woods and been so mad. Yeah, probably. And I went, yeah, my kids think I think they think that I changed in a good way. I'm growing. And I think back on that situation, and I remember I was just content, man. I was just so happy to have some meat. And uh, I said, that's all right, just get another rope. What I did, though, so it doesn't happen again, is I put a cable this year on. Contentment is learned, is a learned experience through circumstance, through trials, which creates an inner peace within you. I want want to give you the final thing, and it's this. Contentment is not an escape from the storm. It's not. But it is peace and calmness while in it. It's not an escape from the storm. But it's peace and calmness while in it. If you notice verse 12, he goes, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. There it is. In any and every, whether it be 
a calm situation or whether it would be a storm, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Contentment is not an escape from the storm. But it is peace that God gives us and calmness while we're in it. Look at these three things real quick. From Warren Wiersbe's keys to contentment. He says, he talks about the overruling providence of God. We're content because we know God's got his hand in all situations in verse 10. Then he talks about the unfailing power of God in verse 13. The unfailing power of God. And then number three, the unchanging promise of God. These are the the Three keys that Warren Wiersbe, the commentator, former pastor, had talked about. The providence of God, the power of God, and the promise of God. I know that God sees all, knows all. He knows my circumstance. I'm important to Him. You're important to Him. He is powerful enough to work in me, to change me, to grow me, to develop me. And I know that he's got promises for me in this life and in the life to come. How much better can that get? Those are the keys to contentment. So Christian, notice that I didn't talk much about happiness. I mentioned it. And happiness is is important, and it's real. But happiness is something that comes and goes. It's more tied to our circumstances. It's more tied to our emotions. Joy, peace, contentment are foundations to our everyday life. And when we learn how to trust Christ, learn how to live for Him, and become self-sufficient in Him, don't project on other people our needs, but cast all our care on Jesus. Through His Holy Spirit, through His powerful work, He can change you and me. And you can start looking at life a little bit different. A little bit different. Yeah, the world's going crazy. Yeah, times are changing. And they will always change until God takes you home. And there will be a lot of things you and me do not like about the world or the culture. But I'll tell you this too. I'll throw this in. This is like a monkey wrench into all of it. I'll tell you this. Young people are not going to to older, bitter, angry victims and old people who are just mad at the world. They're not going to you for life advice. Why would they? Be the growing Christian, the mature Christian, the older Christian that is full of hope full of joy, that is content in his or her place in life and his or her walk in the Lord. That's two babies that are going out. I think that's my sign. (laughs) When the babies say, I'm hungry, it's time for preacher to stop. Let's stand together.